All right. You hear me there, all right? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us on this Sunday through Zoom again. We uh, long for the time when we can all be back together in the church chapel building and see each other face to face, but we are very glad that we have the uh, wonders of technology to still allow us to meet and share thoughts and um, have something <laughs> something of a communion. It's amazing that we serve a God who is everywhere at once and um, is right here in our own living rooms and bedrooms and rec rooms or wherever we're meeting uh, and binding us together in the spirit. So we're very thankful for that. Um, just before we start, uh, I just want to go over some kind of ground rules again that we always do. Um, I think Doug's going to put up a slide with the, uh, the ground rules. So, of course, remember you're on camera. I mean, it's a funny thing to say every time we know we, we logged into the computer and, and put on the camera, but you would not believe the stories that are coming out of the schools of what's happening in, in the homes. Um, people forgetting that they're on camera and, and walking through when their kids are on. So we just, just be careful of what you're involved in doing. Um, make sure your mics are muted. Doug is recording this uh, to, to post on YouTube for later. Anybody wants to come in later. And if we, um, if he has to mute you, he has to stop the recording. So it, it breaks the flow. So just remember to keep your mics muted. Um, it'd be a good time to get your bread and juice right now if you haven't done so already, so that you're ready when we actually break the break the bread and take the juice. And um, he's only going to record the service portion, so at the very end, there'll be a little bit of time of fellowship again, just like we just had. Uh, you don't have to worry about any of that personal stuff that we might be sharing with each other going out uh, and being being posted. So just the service portion, okay? So um, I just want to go back to the Hebrews. Today, John Kember is going to be talking about uh, what we believe about, about God being one God and the Trinity. And um, so I just started thinking about that as far as um, what we could share at the Breaking of Bread and, and kind of organize our thoughts along that line. And uh, I went to Hebrews 1.3, which is on the screen right there. But before we talk about that, I just I was thinking about the, the poor Hebrews, uh, the Hebrew Christians, you know, they were they were caught between two God-given uh, faith systems, if you will. God had given the Old Testament laws and and rituals and ways to come to him and be his people. And, you know, presumably these people that had come to Christ were people who were faithful to follow those laws and follow those rituals and um, had been godly that way. And then Christ was presented to them and they had seen him as the Messiah and recognized that he had been the one that fulfilled the prophecies and everything and, and had, you know, get tentatively maybe even, but they had given themselves to Christ. And then persecution had come along and they had decided that, you know, maybe maybe it wasn't all it was cracked up to be after all. And uh, maybe they had it, had it right with their old beliefs. And so they started going back. And so the writer of Hebrews, who we believe would be Paul, um, writes Hebrews to them to impress upon them that Christ is actually the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. He is, um, he is above and beyond and, and better than all the Old Testament rituals and practices and priesthoods, and he fulfills them all. And right off the hop here in, in chapter 1, he makes some truth claims about Christ, seven actually truth claims about Christ, which are, are just phenomenal when we, when we really think about what they are and what they're saying. So I'm just going to read the first four verses, and then we'll hone in on chapter, or sorry, verse three. It says, uh, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So we know from the Old Testament that the word of God came to the to the prophets, but it was, it was you know, random as far as they were concerned. It just kind of sporadic came um, at, at moments of need and it would come and then they wouldn't hear from God for a while. And then they hear, they'd hear him again. But uh, it says in verse two, he hasn't in his last days spoken to us by his son. And so Christ came and he was the complete fulfillment of the word in the old Testament. They had these little snippets of revelation and they pieced them together and they would learn something about God, learn about what he required of them and how he felt about how they were living. But Christ came and, and they have the complete word. Um, no, nothing lacking in the word. It was right there in its fullest form in Christ. And it says he has appointed him heir of all things through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, 
having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So to the Jewish mind, th these were some amazing truth claims that this writer was, was making about Jesus and really was, was, should have locked in their minds that this one Christ who came uh, w was far superior to their old way of, of coming to God. He was the actual complete fulfillment of all their prophecies and all the Old Testament and was a, a perfect and complete way to come to God. But I want to look at these, I, these claims that are made in, in verse 3. It says, talking about Christ being the brightness of his glory. And, you know, we kind of pass over that, but um, the words that were, were hard to come up with in Latin first and then in English, the, the word to use there for brightness was, was hard. It was it didn't quite capture what the Greek was saying. It has the idea of um, kind of like the sun, kind of like the sun. We, we can't know the sun. We can't know the, the glory of the sun, if you will, except by the rays of light that are coming from it. But when we think about that, we have this idea that the light rays are something separate from the sun itself. And we can know about the sun through those beams of light. But this is, a, this is a, an actually fuller meaning in that the beams themselves are the same as the sun. They're the same as what is emitting the beams of light, the radiance. Um, some translations have used effulgence. I had to look up that word, so don't feel bad. Uh, it kind of just means the same as radiance. But it also doesn't quite capture the whole meaning here. When it says, when, when the writer here says he is the, um, the brightness of his glory, he was giving the readers the idea that Christ was the same as the source. But it was, it was in a way that we could understand, in a way that we could, we could um, come to know the Father, come to know the glory of the Father. Because if, if we were to be in the presence of the Father in his glory unveiled, we would be consumed. And you remember Moses, how he wanted to see God, but he couldn't, he couldn't see God in his full glory. He could only see the, the he could only see it as veiled. And uh, so we have, we have Christ coming and he presents to us the glory in a way that we can understand, but it is the same glory. It is the same um, of the same stuff, if you will, as the, what emits the glory. And then it goes on to say that he's the image, the express image of the person. And again, we have some, some words that are kind of lost. The translation has lost some of what they, they meant. And they had a hard time trying to figure out what words to use. Um, the idea of person even doesn't quite convey all that this word means. But when we see the, the express image, we've heard this from our platform before. People have spoken on this. But it is good to, to review it and to celebrate it. Um, we ha have kind of the idea of an, of an engraving or a, a steel press, uh, something that presses an image onto something else. But it also is the, the image itself. So we have a twofold meaning here. Uh, the Greek word is character, which we would understand um, our own word character comes from. But it, what it means is that the, the image itself bears all the resemblance and all the, the attributes, all the, the fine details and perfections of the original. When we look at that image, when we look at the impressed image, we can see all of what was there before. And it's not just person, it's the, it's the very essence of God. Christ, when we look at Christ, we see all his perfections. We see all, all of God's uh, attributes and all his power and glory. It's impressed into Christ. And if we study Christ enough and get to know him, we will know the Father. And we will know all his perfections and everything about him. It's interesting too, but the word not only means the image itself. So when, when we think of a coin being pressed or, or a wax seal, the image bears um, all the details of the, of the stamp. And, but the word itself is also used of the tool, which I think is pretty cool because Christ is the um, stamp that puts God's image on us. And as he impresses himself on us, we become more like the Father and more like Christ. And so he comes, and the reader of this would have understood completely that Christ is God. He is the same essence as the Father. And he's not just, he wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a, a prophet like all their other prophets, but he was very God himself. And then it goes on to say that he upholds all things by the word of his power. And uh, we were just talking a little bit, Linda and I, about, um, you know, the bomb they dropped on Hiroshima. 
and the awesome power of the atomic bomb. I, I'm not um, a nuclear physicist, obviously, but I understand that the amount of energy, uh, sorry, the amount of matter that was lost when the bomb, when the atom split, was was infinitesimal. We you'd hardly be able to measure it except through mathematics. And yet the amount of energy it released was was devastating to that city. And that was just a little bit of matter. When you think of all the matter and all the universe, the known universe and beyond, um, and God, Christ spoken into being, and now he upholds it by his word. It, it is all glued together, all that power and and all that energy is glued together by his word. What what kind of a God, what kind of a person is this that we serve? <laughs> Christ, who who has this power and has this authority over creation. And yet the next statement condescends to where we are this morning, where it says, when he had by himself, some of your translations don't have that himself, when he had purged our sins or, or washed away our sins or purified our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. And so we, we see God here expressed in his son, but the whole Godhead being involved in this, uh, in this transaction where he just washed away our sins. This God who um, upholds the universe with his power and has no reason other than what's found in his own love to be involved with me at all, decided that he would come and wash away my sins. Tremendous love, tremendous grace, tremendous mercy for us. And it was the whole Godhead that did this. I was thinking about... Um, Colossians 2 9 as well it says in Christ all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily so you think of the God that created the universe and how that's the biggest thing we can imagine but we can't really wrap our minds around what the universe is uh, the size of it and the power of it and the glory of it and God is beyond that he created it and he is more than that and yet somehow it is all packed into Christ and Christ it reveals it to us in a, in a personal and real relationship with us and we just have no, <laughs> no words except thank you for that. Um, we're, John 1, 1 John 3, 9, 5 tells us that Christ appeared in order to take away sins. This God came in, in the person of the Son to come, and he did it to take away our sins so that we could be with him forever. What an amazing and wonderful thought this morning. And I hope um, as we go through this morning and uh, hear the other thoughts that are being shared and sing the songs, that that draws praise from us and thanksgiving to, to realize the Godhead, the, the one God through the person of Christ came and took away our sins when we didn't deserve it. And we are so um, in debt to him for that. So let's, uh, let's remember him. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we serve a God who is a loving God and cares for us because we were so far from you and we lacked any ability to please you or make ourselves right before you. And yet it was in your own heart, in your own counsel, to save us and to bring us back into relationship with you. We thank you that Christ washed away our sins by what he did on the cross. And Lord, we thank you that you've renewed us into a relationship with you and we can come before you this morning. Your spirit is binding us together into a body that is um, able to commune with you and have this wonderful fellowship. And Lord, we pray that you'd oversee our meeting now, that you would help us all to enter into this communion in a real powerful way. And Lord, that we would bring your son great glory and honor in the way that we talk about him and think about him and sing to him. Lord, we just pray now that you'd bless us and we thank you so much for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Say that. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm enjoying this thought a lot, the oneness of the Godhead and our salvation. And uh, I would like first to focus on this scope of our salvation. It is far beyond our understanding, and I'm not going to cover it in a few minutes, but just some highlights. As uh, Paul said in Hebrews 2, how we can escape if we neglect so great so great a salvation. It's huge. Uh, I will start by highlighting the problem, like what was God saving us from? And what did God ha have to do to accomplish this salvation? So the problem was, as we all know, that Adam sinned. And we understand from Romans chapter 5 that through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin. So by the sin of Adam, death entered through this world. And according to Romans 5, we understand that we were weak, we were sinners, we were enemies, we were dead in our trespasses. But not only us, we understand from Romans 8 that the creation, the whole universe was corrupted. So you read in Romans 8, 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So this huge universe that Jason reminded us about, this was corrupted by sin. The other dimension to the problem is the value or the worth of our souls. It is a big lie that Satan is putting in the mind of this world that we are worthless human beings. In the sight of God, who has created us in his own image, our souls are priceless. There is nothing in this world that can pay for the value or, like I will read to you a verse in Psalm 49, speaking about people who have money. Psalm 49 verses 7, none of them about these people can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly or precious. The redemption of one person's soul in the sight of I, of God is very precious. And the verse would continue that this redemption, it shall cease forever, meaning that no one for eternity, other than God, can pay for the ransom of one soul of him. So we have the death in human beings, we have the corruption in the universe, we have the value of the people who were lost, and then we have the power of the enemy. There is an enemy that is working against God and against us. We understand from Ephesians 6, that we are, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So Satan, with all of his power, with all of his organized army, has access to the heavenly places. And he has access to the throne of God himself. We can understand that from Job 1 when he presented and he accused Job to God. So Satan has this huge power and he has access to heavenly places. And then we have another aspect of the problem that God was facing. 
And this belongs to God himself, that he cannot tolerate sin. We understand that from Habakkuk, that his eyes cannot behold evil. He cannot tolerate it. That's his nature. And the last thing that I would mention there, that God is righteous. And he has to demonstrate his own righteousness to everyone. That's what we read in Romans 3, that God, when he will solve the issue, when he will accomplish this salvation, he has to account to everything that he is in his character, meaning his love, his mercy, his uh, righteousness, his intolerance to sin. How can God, this triune God, will accomplish this amazing salvation? to solve all of this problem, and he will come out as righteous at the end, meaning he has fulfilled everything and he demonstrated all of his attributes in one action. And this is our salvation. And let's read the verse now that's on the screen. But when the fullness of the time had come, God, here is God the Father, sent forth his Son, God the Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as son. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit. Here is the Holy Spirit. Here is the oneness of the Godhead and salvation. God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, this is an amazing thing. You are an heir, an heir of God through Christ. And the point that I'm trying to make here, that God had a plan. God created mankind in his image and God wanted a relationship. And God created Eden, the garden for Adam, to have a relationship with Adam. And then came Satan and ruined God's initial plan. And as if this Satan in the heavenly places, he's mocking God. You had this plan, I have ruined it for you. But God accepted the challenge. And in this amazing salvation, the so great salvation, he did not only restore us to a garden where we had a relationship as created human beings to a creator, but he did much, much, much more than that. I, I'm going to highlight just a few things, but that's not everything. According to our verse here, we can cry, Abba, Father. We are not only dealing with a creator, we are dealing with a heavenly father. In the Old Testament, the saints of the Old Testament, Abraham, David, Solomon, you, you name them, they did not have this relationship as with God as a father. Only the Lord Jesus Christ revealed that in the New Testament. For example, to the Samaritan woman that the father is seeking such worshipers, or when he rose from the dead, he told Mary, go tell the disciples that I'm going up to my father and your father. We have a father in heaven. More, we are now the temple of God. We read that in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? We're not just, again, in a garden dealing with the creator. We, you and I, are the temple of God. Another practical aspect, we are predestined to be in the image of his son. God loves his son. God is very pleased with his son. Three times in the New Testament, the heaven would open and God would reveal his pleasure with his son. The most amazing thing in my mind that you and I, that we were once dead in our trespasses and we were weak and we were enemies, we now, if we will allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we can be conformed to the image of his son and our lives, what I am doing at work and what I'm dealing with my family, how I'm dealing with my brothers and sisters, how I'm dealing with anyone in this life, I can be carrying the image of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. And my life can be an aroma to God the Father when he sees me and you and each one of us 
being conformed to the image of his son. This is his salvation. God announced in the New Testament, which was a mystery to the Old Testament, the concept of the church. Again, this was not in the garden, but now we are part of this glorious body. It is his own body, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the church. I'm going to read verses that I'm not going to comment on it because they are beyond me to understand. For example, in Ephesians 1.22, and he, meaning God the Father, put all things under his feet, under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is the fullness of God himself who fills all in all. Beyond me and it needs a long time to explain. Look at the glory of this church in the book of Revelations. I'm going to read some verses there. Uh, Revelations 21, nine. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That's the church. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need for the sun or for the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, the Lamb is its light. This is the scope of our salvation. But if I'll go back to the verse that you have on the screen, the last part of it, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Heir of God. We have an inheritance and we're not inheriting anything less than God himself. Christ is the Son of God, and he has, by his character, by his position as the Son of God, he is heir to the full honor and glory of heaven. But we are now united to him, and we are entitled, and I say that with a holy courage, based on my understanding of the scripture, that we are entitled to all the privileges of Christ himself. All what the Father has is ours. This is the scope of our salvation. Again, Satan ruined the plan. God accepted a challenge and he made such a glorious salvation that fulfilled all the requirements of himself as a God. And he brought us into a massive and amazing and majestic glory that we do not understand. And he loves us that much. I will end by one thing that I learned last night from one of the commentators. If you look at verse six on the screen, and because you are sons, this is plural. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. But look at the change in verse seven. Therefore, we are no longer a slave, but a son. This is singular. God, based on that, wants you and me this morning, each one individually, to understand that this is personal for you and I. Each one of us has this amazing value that we read about in Psalms, that it's amazing in the sight of God, the way he loves us, it's beyond our understanding, the way he loves us individually. One thing that I learned in, when I was in Sunday school, that a statement that I couldn't understand, but the Sunday school teacher told me that if you are the only person who was a sinner in the world, Christ would have come and he would have done this complete salvation for you personally as a man. It didn't click. But more and more I'm understanding it. 
And a verse like this would prove it, that we as individuals, each one of us, you can put your name in this verse. God loves you that much that you as an individual, you have this great value in his eyesight and he loves you that much. And the Lord Jesus Christ for the joy that was ahead of him, he endured the cross, despising the shame for you and I this morning. This Godhead in unity worked this amazing salvation for you and I this morning. I pray that this would sink in, in our minds more and more and will affect our lives more and more. And we can offer the worship to God this morning as we're remembering the Lord Jesus and his work. Let's give him thanks. Our Heavenly Father, we are amazed at this salvation. We cannot understand and fathom the depth of your love to us and how much you have sacrificed to save people who have ruined everything. But because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus that we are remembering this morning, you have brought us into amazing relationship and you promised us glory and inheritance. It is not just forgiveness of sin, but much, much more glorious than that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your obedience. We thank you that in the fullness of time, you came and you sacrificed everything for our own sake. And we love you and we give you all the praise and honor that our feeble minds and words can give you this morning. Amen. share together in this uh, wonderful uh, remembrance service, even though it's, uh, we are hampered in some ways, by uh, we still have this privilege of being together in spirit. Um, we're looking this morning at uh, actually the full title that was given to me to consider, uh, prepare consideration, is the oneness in purpose within the Godhead for our salvation. And as I thought on this, the verse that came to mind 
and uh, I'll explain more in, in a little while, but um, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13 and 14, we read, the blood of bull, goats and of bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? And verse 13, and Jason already covered it very well. It covers the period of the law. It was an act of faith for those people to do it. And, and the law was, in fact, a, a ministry of grace by God. We speak of law versus grace, but it was a period of grace, nonetheless, because it provided a means of salvation. But it was on the basis of outward ceremonial cleanness, and not, nothing. the law could do nothing to cleanse the heart and to change the heart of the man. Uh, but in Christ, and the blood of Christ, we'll see there's so much more. Now, as we say, we're talking about the oneness and pur purpose of the Godhead. Uh, John's going to be uh, looking at this in the next service, I believe, uh, what is referred to as the Trinity. Uh, that's a human invention, that term. The Godhead is the biblical term. And then we know it consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is a mystery that will defy our best rational thought. And it will remain unfathomable to the human mind. But we can understand some things about it by the revelation of Scripture. We uh, so it's talking about this Godhead, the the embodiment of God in three persons. In Genesis one verse twenty six, we read that God said, "Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness." Now, if we take the plain reading of that text, it implies a collective council within the Godhead regarding the creature man that would be made, and there it was and always is full agreement within that Godhead council. Uh, we see a similar council spoken of in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, where Peter is preaching the first sermon that was ever preached in the Christian church, uh, where he says, him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate council, or in some of your versions, a determinate purpose, of God you have taken and by wicked or lawless hands have crucified and slain or put to death. So we see that there was this council together amongst the Godhead to uh, deliver the Lord Jesus Christ uh, unto death. So again, what we see that what has transpired on earth was that which was purposed before the world began in the fellowship of the Godhead. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10 are two verses which uh, have a great bearing on this. And we find a lot of wonderful, wonderful uh, insights into the purpose and, and being of God in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying this is what the council says my counsel or purpose shall stand and i will do all my pleasure now uh, in preparation for these thoughts i went through uh, the concordance and i looked up all the things that give god pleasure and there's a lot of them but i will name just four of them or five of them in, in keeping with the theme that we have our salvation but first of all <clears throat> And, and this one was already mentioned, Colossians 1, verse 19, it pleased the Father. So this brought pleasure to the Father that in Christ the Son, in his human capacity, that should all the fullness dwell. So all of God's uh, essence was contained in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say we are complete in him. And that brings pleasure to God. <clears throat> and then in um, Revelation 4, 11, uh, we find the creation, all of it, the, everything around us, the world and everything in it was created for God's pleasure. For thou was created all things, is the song of the glorified saints. Thou was created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So God takes pleasure in this creation. Uh, a mystery.
history that uh, brings us to tears if when it's properly presented is from Isaiah 53 uh, and verse 10, a mystery that shows that God's ways are so much higher than our ways. We would never come up with a plan like this of our own. For it pleased the Father to bruise him. Please God to bruise the Lord Jesus Christ. He has put him to grief. So many times down through history, blame has been ascribed to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we blame the Romans. Sometimes we blame the Jews. Sometimes we blame ourselves, but we won't get it right unless we realize that it was God the Father who put the Lord Jesus Christ to death, and it was determined beforehand in the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now, something bringing it closer to home in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, and that's great, <laughs> it's a great wisdom, and there's nothing he doesn't know or know how to use that knowledge, the world, through its wisdom, knew not God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching, the preaching of the gospel, to save those who believe. And uh, most of us, if not all of us who are tuning in here, are those who have fallen heir to this tremendous privilege of being saved by the grace of God. And then Ephesians 1 verse 5 says, having, this is speaking of God, having predestinated or predestined us to the adoption of sons, which Emad has so capably presented to us, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So we have all these things that bring God pleasure. And, and that is what the, the, the atmosphere, if you like, or the very temperament of the presence of God is. In thy presence, says the scriptures, is fullness of joy at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's nothing in the presence of God that does not bring pleasure. And these are just some of the things. And the blessing is that we're here recounting and, and uh, evaluating these things as they pertain to us. Again, one more in Luke chapter 22, verse 22, we see here the Lord Jesus Christ say these words as he's going to the cross. And truly, it's in the upper room, and truly the Son of Man goes as it was determined. So this was determined before worlds began in the councils of the eternity, in the, in the wisdom of the Godhead. But then it says, but woe unto the man by whom he was betrayed. So we see that there's an intersection here. So we see this mysterious intersection of the divine immutable purpose and the human will. God's purpose determined within the Godhead will always come to pass. Although God uses human agents and sometimes angelic beings, often unbeknownst to them in accomplishing those purposes, and often they do them with the wrong motive. No one who was calling for Jesus' death had any view that they were accomplishing God's will at that time. They thought they were doing something out of their own will but they were the blood of jesus christ is what they wanted and the blood of jesus christ is what god needed in order to save us so god got what he needed and man will pay an awful price um, who rejected him when we read about divine activity and attaining human salvation the father and the son are, are the ones that we frequently see working together even in the, the great verse john three sixteen, we read for god the father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and so we see this mysterious activity within the godhead between the father and the son the, the, the father sent and and the son went but we don't hear their reference to the spirit um, in 1 Peter 3, verse 18, for Christ also has once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. I suppose we could speak of God as the plurality there, but it, it, usually when it hasn't got the definite article, it's speaking of God the Father. Again, the divine personages in view are the Father and the Son. And this is what we are told would be the modus operandi of the Holy Spirit during this age. In John 16, verse three, here's the reading from the Amplified Version. However, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, and in the brackets, including the gospel truth. He shall not speak from himself or of his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears, in brackets, from the Father, the message regarding the Son, and he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. 
so the the spirit does not exalt himself he exalts christ and so that is the uh, way he works so there are few verses that we read uh where the spirit appears but the passage we have before us in chapter uh, hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 we do have an, an outline of the workings of the godhead in the accomplishment of our cleansing from sin therefore making us able to be in fellowship with god where we read let me refer to it again look you can read it there how much more is looking back to what god was able to accomplish under the limitations of the law where man's heart was not changed now where god has provided a plan whereby he can actually change us from within make us desire to serve him desire to follow him to love him out of a pure heart fervently how much more then will the blood of christ so there the son who through the eternal spirit there's the holy spirit offered himself unblemished to god cleanse our conscience god the father cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living god so in order to for god to accomplish the salvation which we are are the work of which we are memorializing here together in communion uh, there was a necessity for blood and we're going to remember that human blood was required to satisfy the divine requirement for without the shedding of blood we're told there is no forgiveness there is no remission of sins hebrews 9 verse 22 and to accomplish that purpose the son would take on a human body a human form to provide that essential element that would provide the propitiation for our sins and there's the involvement of the holy spirit again it's mysterious at least it is to me for without the shedding of blood there is no forgive i'm sorry um at least to me, uh in that he provided the means whereby the spotless sacrifice of the son could be offered to the father one might say and, and i say this carefully because i don't exactly understand it but we might say that the spirit acted interdimensionally he was residing in and upon the lord jesus christ in the flesh and in, in humanity in his human form and at the same time he was in the presence of the father ever discerning the father's will and putting it into practice in the son and so he's acting this uh interdimensionally between the son on earth and the father in the highest realms of spirit in the heavenlies now the out glorious outcome of this as we read at the end of the verse is that it has cleansed our conscience the conscience uh, it says that the law could not uh, solve the issue of human conscience we, we always knew within ourselves that there was this motion towards sin and we were powerless to do anything about it but now in christ our conscience can be cleaned it comes from the word to know skio in the greek and con within conscience to know within we can know the peace the joy the fellowship the open-faced fellowship with god right here right now and for this i am now very thankful and i will be and you will be eternally thankful let's thank the father through the son by means of the spirit right now our father we and give you thanks for the treasures of your word uh, many things as we're told uh, peter had trouble handling them he said there are many things that, are, that paul wrote are difficult and hard to be understood and they they go beyond the bounds of human reason and understanding but we can know them and we can claim them and we can embrace them one is that uh, you god our father and your son and the spirit live together in eternal perfection uh in one essence as god and yet uh, presenting in three persona and uh, these have uh, manifestly declared your desire that we who are made in the image as jason so wonderfully presented will share in the privileges and glory of sonship for eternity and and we can only say lord we we know our conscience bears witness we know this is not something we deserve this is something that is issued forth from your throne through grace alone uh, we don't merit it nothing we do in all eternity could ever pay the ransom that was necessary to bring us into this position but christ shed the blood the holy spirit by a mighty act which we don't understand presented that spotless sacrifice before you father and you said it's perfect 
And for that, you've declared us righteous. God in heaven, through the wonderful medium of the Holy Spirit who now resides within. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, we come to you and give you thanks. We ask you that we would, our songs of praise and adoration and worship of your son will bring a wonderful atmosphere and, and before your very throne this moment, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.
close our eyes as we uh, just uh, pray for this uh, the young ones that are before us. Um, dear Heavenly God and Father, we just come before you and uh, we're just thinking of the sacrifice that was made, this body that was put on the tree for us. Dear Lord, we, we think of, we were reading just a short while ago how uh, he was sustaining all things by his word. Yet, uh, yet he willingly allowed himself to be, to be beaten and, and nailed upon that tree for us. And dear Lord, we are just so thankful. We, uh, I, I even struggle thinking of words that would uh, describe how how unworthy I feel and and how just uh, how grateful I am. So, dear Lord, we just thank you for that and just pray for each one of us here as we. Uh, Take this uh, symbol of, of your son's body. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. Dear Heavenly God and Father, again we come before you and and we've been reminded today as well that blood had to be shed. And dear Lord, uh, as we, we take this cup, we're reminded of the blood of your son, the, the unblemished sacrifice that was put on that tree for us, that cross, and, and dear Lord, that, the blood that spilled forth and, and it, for us. Dear Lord, we've also talked of how if it was one of us, he would have done the same. And But dear Lord, he's, he did it for each one of us and, and he, he wants a, a personal relationship with us. And dear Lord, just, just amazing that is. Um, we think of how uh, we, were, we were dead in trespasses and, and we've become heirs. Wow, just amazing how that is, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that this would be on our hearts as we take this cup that's before us. Amen. I uh, thank you everybody for joining us today and being part of this and for the men who shared I thank you for your thoughts um, I think the Lord was uh, overseeing all this I want to share close in a with just a poem that I found as I was preparing by uh, Martha Snell Nicholson I don't know a lot about her I have heard this poem in the past and maybe you have too but it's so appropriate for what we've been thinking about today it's called I sinned or my advocate. And again, it's by Martha Snell Nicholson. And it goes like this. I sinned and straightway, post haste, Satan flew before the presence of the Most High God and made a, ra a railing accusation there. He said, this soul, this thing of clay and sod has sinned. Tis true that he has named thy name, but I demand his death. For thou hast said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Shall not thy sentence be fulfilled? Is justice dead? Send now this wretched sinner to his doom. What other thing can righteous ruler do? And thus he, he did accuse me day and night, and every word he spoke, O God, was true. Then quickly one arose up from God's right hand, before whose glory angels veiled their eyes. He spoke, each jot and tittle of the law must be fulfilled. The guilty sinner dies. But wait, suppose his guilt were all transferred to me, that I paid his penalty. Behold my hands, my side, my feet. One day I was made sin for him and died that he might be presented faultless at thy throne. And Satan fled away, full well he knew that he could not prevail against such love. For every word my dear Lord spoke was true. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this marvelous and wonderful truth that we've been thinking about today that 
within your Godhead, you purpose that you would save me and save each one of us, that you would prepare for yourself a holy people who would be the body of Christ and somehow contain the fullness of your son. Lord, we don't understand it, but we accept it and we believe it. And now, Lord, we pray that by your Spirit's ministry this week, starting at this very moment, we would be changed in our hearts and be continually being changed so that we can be more like the Son who died to save us and represent him and, and bear his image. Lord, we pray that you would take us from here with thanksgiving and joy, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just some announcements at the end here. Next service is going to be at 1045. So uh, the link was sent to your email. It's also on Faith Life, and apparently it's in Facebook. Uh, so you have lots of options for how to find that link uh, to join us at 1045. We're uh, continuing on our new series, The Statements of Faith. And uh, today's is We Believe in One God by John, John Kemmer is going to bring that to us today. And we uh, encourage you to uh, check Faith Life and the Southdale Connect for prayer items and announcements that are on there. Uh, one more thought about the the YouTube video that uh, is going to be there, the live link. If you subscribe to that, there is some benefit to us uh, in in the logistics of sending it out and, and hosting it. So if you're uh, someone who regularly avails yourself of the videos on YouTube there, please hit the subscribe button, and it will also make it easier for you to find the videos as well. Um, our missionary of the month is Arthur Taylor of Welland Canal Mi Ministries, missions, and uh, if you've been going to Southdale for more than a year, then you are aware of Art, Art Taylor and his wife Dorcas. Art always comes in January. This is the first year, apparently, in 45 years. He hasn't been able to do that, but he always comes, and he's full of amazing stories about how the Lord's working in, in the ships uh, that come through the canal down there in Welland, and uh, he just has tremendous liberty to go onto those ships and present the gospel there, so uh, bear him up in your prayers, remember him, and uh, South Dale will be sending a, a financial donation to them um, on your behalf as well. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go to Douglas, and then uh, there'll be a short time of, of fellowship. Everybody loves a winner. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And today we're talking about the Beatitudes. We're talking about the second to the last Beatitude, which is where Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, I don't know why, but it seems like as a kid, being called kid is one of the worst insults you can ever get. If someone says, move it, kid, that's like the worst. And I one time I was at the playground and there was this this big kid. He was He wasn't that much older than me, but he was way bigger than me. And he... He just shoved me. He knocked me down on the ground and said, move it, kid. And oh man, I'm just, I'm on the ground and he shoved me and he just insulted me. And I was just so mad. And, and all the other kids at the playground, they kind of saw this and they started kind of gathering around, you know, like kids do when there's about to be a fight. And there were even a couple of kids who started yelling that they started going, fight, fight, fight. Cause they wanted me to get up and they wanted me to, to teach this big kid a lesson. And you know, he was a little bit bigger than me, but I, you know, I've been taking some self-defense classes, and I honestly, I think I could have taken him. You know, he was big, but he, he's pretty slow. I think that if he and I got in an actual fight, I think I would have won. And that's what everybody wanted to see. They wanted to see a fight. But, you know, in these Beatitudes, you know, we're talking about how Jesus was, was saying that there are people that seem unfortunate, but they're actually blessed. And I think that in this one, he's talking about kind of how we look at conflict, right? You know, not just like a physical fight, but, you know, arguments too. It seems like everybody loves a winner. You know, if I had gotten into a fight with this kid and I would have won, man, you better believe those kids who had kind of gathered around us and had started watching us, that they would have been cheering for me and they would have been so excited that I beat this bigger kid and taught him a lesson. And, you know, there's this thing deep down inside of us where it's like if someone challenges us, we want to beat them, Right. Whether it's like a real fight or just like an argument, you know, someone calls you a name, you want to call them a, a worse name. You want to make them cry. Or if someone pushes you, you want to push them right back. And that, honestly, that impresses a lot of people, but it doesn't impress God. You know, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You know, if you win a fight or an argument, you might get an attaboy or an girl from other people. You might get people who are like, yeah, good job, you sure showed them. But would you rather have that from other people or would you rather have that from God? I hope the answer is God because, well, let me tell you, that's the right answer. 
in any kind of fight, there's either the choice to make the fight worse and worse and worse and bigger and bigger and bigger, or to kind of diffuse the situation and, and just leave. Now, there might be a time where you have to stand up for yourself or you have to stand up for someone else, but if you can avoid a fight or an argument, that's the truly impressive thing. Anybody can get into a fight, but it takes real courage and, and internal strength to avoid one. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would be peacemakers. That instead of trying to win fights, you would try to end fights. You know, when that kid pushed me, I could have fought with him. I might have even been able to beat him. But instead, what I chose to do is just walk away. Do you think the kids cheered for me when I did that? Mm -mm. No. They would have cheered if I beat him. Absolutely. But instead, what I heard was, aww, they wanted to see a fight. But I would much rather get an attaboy from God than from people. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God.